Thank you. Thank you for coming out this evening. It's beautiful out, and I'm sure you were tempted to stay where you were, but we appreciate your uh, participation this evening. My name is Karen Sonneborg. I'm a housing and planning consultant, and my colleague here is David Eisen from Abacus Architects and Planners. And we actually prepared the housing production plan uh, in 2013, which uh, has expired, and we're doing an update to be submitted to the state. And, and before I go on, just one, two things. One is, if you could hold your questions and comments to the end, that would be helpful, because we really want to get through the presentation as expeditiously as we can so we can hear from you. Um, and the other thing is that I wanted to just give you uh, a, a quick synopsis of what housing production is. Uh, it's actually a subset of the Chapter 40B regulations that, were, that was meant to provide greater local control over housing development, such that if a community prepared a housing production plan that met all the requirements that the state had listed, which are considerable, and then um, had it approved by both the planning board and either the city council or board of selectmen, and then uh, submitted it to the state, uh, then, and then actually produced affordable housing such that equivalent to one half of 1% of the town of the city's year-round housing stock. And for PBD, that's 111 units. It's ambitious. Uh, and the state understands that, uh, really wanting to see some um, progress made. So if, within a, um, with, if the town city can actually produce that 111 units, um, it becomes what's called certified, which means it does not have to um, it, it, it doesn't have to approve or it can deny unwanted uh, Chapter 40B uh, applications without the developer's ability to appeal that decision. If the city could create 222 units, um, it would have a two-year period, what they call the safe harbor, where it could potentially deny what it considered an inappropriate 40B application that didn't meet um, um, community needs. So 111 units produced would get you a one-year safe harbor, 222 would get you um, a two-year safe harbor. So as I mentioned, um, one of the reasons for doing housing production plans is to get this greater local control over housing development, um, uh, what's considered a hostile um, 40B developments in particular. But it also has a number of other real benefits, such as to get updated information on demographic, economic, and housing trends and how the actual housing market is affecting various populations and income levels in the community. And through these indicators of need, we pinpoint priority housing needs for the town to um, have foremost in its housing agenda. And then we identify strategies to address those priority housing needs. Um, another important benefit and purpose of the plan is to uh, provide guidance on strategically investing local resources to leverage other types of financing, both public and private. And another benefit or purpose is to offer information to developers, both nonprofit and for-profit, on the type of development that the town would, the city would like to see uh, given its identified needs and priorities. And this plan, like the one we did in 2013, 
is augmented by a series of visual representations on development opportunities. Um, it provides a little bit more information with respect to what can go into uh, various locations, what types of housing um, should the city look at in promoting to address these wide range of housing needs that are uh, included in the housing um, production plan. And, and, and a very important purpose is to help educate the community on the benefits and needs for affordable housing and to garner greater local support for housing initiatives. So this event tonight is kind of a, an important component of that purpose. And it is also on cable access TV, so hopefully people who can't be here tonight uh, will be able to uh, get a sense of what's being proposed. Uh, this plan, like the one in 2013, borrows from the 2002 master plan as an overall goal is to ensure that a full range of housing options exist for all Peabody residents and families, regardless of income level, physical ability, and age. Um, and the housing policy focuses on th uh, the following key areas that were also identified in the master plan. Uh, development of new units to meet state housing goals, that 10% state level, which we will talk about um, momentarily. Uh, preservation improvement of the existing housing stock to maintain affordable units and to upgrade living conditions and property values. And a use of regulations to encourage and support affordable housing, all that are going to be addressed in the uh, recommended strategies. So thought kind of to do a basic slide on what is affordable housing. Um, and there are varying definitions. For example, HUD's definition is if you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing, whether it's for rental or home ownership, you're living in what's by common definition is in housing that's not affordable. Um, the definition that we typically hear about is the one under Chapter 40B, where a unit, in order to be counted as part of the subsidized housing inventory, getting to that 10% affordability threshold, has to meet a number of important requirements. Um, and first of all, it has to be affordable to a household earning at or below 80% of area median income. An area, we're talking about the greater Boston metropolitan area that actually even includes some communities in New Hampshire, goes all the way down to the coastal communities and even out um, to, you know, um, past 490, well not past 495, to like Framingham. Um, the fiscal year that 2019 income limits have just recently been released. Just for an example, for a household of three, fiscal year, the 2018 income limits were $73,000. So we're talking about working families here. The 2019 limits have gone up substantially, like 10% to $80,300, uh, which I think took uh, a lot of us involved in the affordable housing uh, field by surprise. Somewhat disconcerting because uh, affordable purchase prices and rents are largely indexed in many cases to these area median income limits, which means that tenants and 40B units or other types of rental units that are supported um, by the government or uh, approved by the government, um, are some will have a hard time uh, affording increased rents. So um, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, the units have to be permanent. That's why mobile homes typically aren't uh, included. And they have to be subsidized directly by a local, state, or federal source or approved by a subsidizing agency. For example, 40B development, in order for the developer to submit a comprehensive permit application to the zoning board, has to get the go-ahead um, 
from a subsidizing agency. The units are deed restricted, and we're moving more and more towards in perpetuity. And they have to be affirmatively marketed. And the state is pretty prescriptive on what this means. Um, it's certainly, they want people who would not likely hear about an affordable housing opportunity outside of the community itself to have a shot. And so there are a whole host of, of ways that they want the units to be affirmatively marketed. So what housing is affordable in PBD is based on these requirements. So of the 22,135 year-round housing units, the state currently counts 2,051 units, or 9.27%, as part of the subsidized housing inventory. And this is down from 10.6% before the 2010 census was, re were, um, was released. So there is currently a gap of 163 units to meet the 10% state target. Um, there are some additional units that should be included, that are eligible to be included in the subsidized housing inventory that will take um, the community to about 9.4% affordability threshold. Um, and when the 2020 census figures are released, um, based on our calculations, this, you know, projecting growth, we're uh, suggesting that, that the city be very close to the 10% level, maybe at 9.9%, assuming that there's no uh, fall off of units that have, uh, where their affordability has expired, that those units, expiring use units as we call them, that affordability has been extended. and. Um, that the, some of the projects that we've included in this, um, in this uh, housing plan uh, actually come to fruition and these 29 uh, eligible units get added to the um, subsidized housing um, inventory. Um, expiring use projects remain a potential problem. This is where based on housing was financed um, there are usually some terms of how long they are in place. I got to say that the city has been very effective. Uh, just, just recently, affordability restrictions have been extended for a number of very important projects, and that includes the uh, tannery, um, the uh, feather weather, uh, weather apartments, and the family estates co-op. So, um, there, there is progress has been made. And just to give you an idea, current subsidized housing inventory units, 78% currently are rental units, 2% are ownership units, 9% of the units are for special needs populations and group homes, and 11% are through the rehab loan program. The rehab loan program typically had the shorter deed, deed restrictions, like 15 years, so they have been falling off the SHI, um, uh, some number on an annual basis. So the first required part of a housing production plan is a comprehensive and detailed housing needs assessment. So I'm going to go through and highlight uh, what I think are the kind of key demographic, economic, and housing trends and focus on some what we have identified as priority housing needs before we get to the specific strategies to address those needs. So under the demographic shifts, there has been um, slow recent population growth. And you see from this chart that takes the number of, uh, of residents from 1950 through uh, 2017, and this is based on the decennial uh, census figures, and in 2017, it's the, um, the, uh, the census estimates from the American Community Survey. And you see the big jump in um, residents between 1950 and 1970, some decline in the 1970s, and then a pretty flat uh, 
population, stable population after that. And then from 2000 to 2010, we see some increase. And then once again, between 2010 to 2017, uh, pretty uh, flat growth. Uh, so actually, um, uh, between 2000 and 2010, there was a 9% population uh, growth down to 2.7% in um, uh, between 2010 and 2000, um, uh, 2017. And this 2017 figure is very close to the city census uh, figure as well. Um, but there are various um, entities, including the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and the State Data Center at the University of uh, Massachusetts Donahue Institute, suggest pretty sub significant population growth through uh, 2030. Uh, MAPC, based on their conservative projections, suggests that between 2010 and 2030, there will be a 7.5% population growth to um, about 55,000 people. The State Data Center is even higher projected growth, 18% population growth to over uh, 60,000 uh, residents. Based on well, let me get, I'll get that that. Another key factor is, uh, involves um, shifts between age groups. So there have been declines in younger residents and gains in older ones. For example, those under 18 increased by 8.2% between 1990 and 2017, um, um, decreased, I should say, decreased by, uh, uh, 8.2%, and those 25 to 34 decreased by 18%, and those 35 to 44 decreased by 22%. On the other end of the age range, those 55 to 64 increased by 52%, and those 65 plus increased by 65%. Let me show you this uh, age distribution. So the the, the, the uh, first column in these groups are, include the 1990 census, then it's the 2000 census, and then it's the 2017 census estimates. And the first group of columns is under 18 years old, then it's 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, then 65 plus. And you see net declines between the 1990 census and 2017 census estimate for the younger age cohorts and increases in the older ones. In the 65 plus group, you see significant growth. That's the baby boomers. We're driving this, the demographics, not just in PBD, but uh, you know, through most or many communities in the, um, in the Commonwealth. And when we talk about high projected increases in older residents, this uh, chart shows a comparison of population change, where the blue columns are for total population, the red for those under 15, and the green for over 65. And these were prepared by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, the, the information for PBD is then the far left grouping. Then they have to compare PBD to other what they call regional urban centers. And then there's the North Shore Task Force, which is kind of the regional uh, uh, group of communities, and then Metropolitan Boston. So you see that there are similar shifts. And actually, um, PUD, with a projected increase in those 65 and over, 55% between 2010 and 2030, it's actually lower than the other um, you know, groupings that MAPC provides. Um, the total population change is a bit higher, and the, the decline in children is across the board uh, and is uh, comparable 
to other regional urban centers. Uh, census information also said that suggests that there are decline in families, and it's correlated to decline in children that uh, has been occurring and it's projected to continue to occur. Just to give you an example, 74% uh, of all households in PVD involved families in 1990, and that's been reduced to 62% based on the 2017 census uh, estimates. Um, and uh, just to give you a com comparison, um, this is uh, th th this is there was a 21.4 percent increase in the number of households. So the pop the uh, number of households were increasing, and the number the percentage of families was decreasing, and, and leads largely to uh, increases in smaller households, particularly um, those living alone. And once again, this is affected by the aging of the baby boomers. Um, for ex and I give you an example of uh, the folks living alone increased uh, from about 25% in 2000 to 32%, almost a third by 2017. And increases in smaller households kind of calls out the need to increase um, smaller units. Um, and projections indicate higher household growth than population growth through 2030. Um, there, the um, households are projected to grow by 16.1% between 2010 and 2030, which is double what the projected 7.5% population uh, growth. Just going to provide some information on economic trends. Um, there have been rising income levels, but the increase, for example, in the household median income, um, while significant, is still lag behind inflation. Um, the median household income, based on 2017 census estimates, is $65,080. Uh, Five dollars, and there has been some growing income disparities. So there have been decreases in the number of uh, households earning less than thirty-five thousand um, dollars, going from um, twenty-six point five percent in twenty seventeen, from forty-three percent in. Uh, 1990, but substantial increases in those earning more than $100,000, from 5.6 percent of all households in 1990 to 31.5 percent uh, in 2017. Um, another disparity is in, in, involving tenure. So the median income of homeowners, uh, based again on the 2017 census estimates is 76,158, which increased by 13.8% between 2010 and 2017. Renters' income is about half, uh, 36,419, that increases by a lesser amount, only about 9.6%. Uh, um, diverse and expanding labor force, uh, some good signs for, uh, for the city. Uh, there has been an increase in those who work in PBD, um, going from 235 some odd uh, workers in 2010 to 24,453 in 2017. Um, and unemployment has gone down from 7.4% to 2.8% in line with what has been happening um, largely uh, after the recession, and certainly in the Boston area. Another point is the average weekly wage was $995, which translates into an annual income of about $52,000, which is significantly lower than that $65,000 um, median household income 
which does suggest that people who actually have jobs, work in Peabody, have somewhat lower incomes than those who live in the community. Well, I should explain that. So the, this shows the change in the income distribution from like the further left under $10,000 to the one columns on the right being 100 and 149, 150,000, and then 150,000 up. And you see the real increase in the higher income earners. Certainly, there is a growing gap between incomes and housing costs. So the top line is the median single family house price going from 1990 to 2017. The bottom line is um, the increase in median income levels. And you see with time, we have a widening uh, gap. So with respect to housing, we have slower housing growth between 1990 and 2009, housing growth was about 20 percent, but nevertheless it was higher than the population growth during that period, about 9 percent. Um, clearly the increase, uh, this has been affected by the increase in smaller households. Um, and the projected housing growth between 2010 and 2030 um, is, according to MAPC, about 16.7 percent to, by 2020, about 24,223 units, and by 2030, 26,000 units. Based on the building permit activity of 226 units produced between 2010 and 2018, these figures look wildly high. Um, and with looking at maybe by 2020, when the census figures are released, having a um, total housing figure of about 23,000 uh, makes sense. That would mean that the city was very close to the 10% level at about 9.9% and that um, the housing production goal that's currently 111 units annually would increase to about 115 units um, per year. Uh, there is a comparable level of owner occupancy in Peabody at 65.5 percent to Essex County, um, which is at 63.8 um, uh, percent. Um, continue increase in rental units. Uh, the city has done a, a really amazing job in producing uh, rental units and helping to dis diversify its housing stock. For example, between 1990 and 2017, there were 2,408 new rental units produced compared to 1,503 uh, new ownership uh, units. Um, and a sig the number of units and structures of 10 or more units doubled during that period very low vacancy rates. The vacancy rate for both rental units and homeownership units was 1% based on the 2017 census estimates. Any vacancy rate below 5% represents very tight market conditions. And housing costs remain high. The median single family home price based on banker and tradesman information as of the end of uh, 2018 was 431000 which requires an income of about $98,000 based on a number assumption, including not spending more than 30% of income on housing costs. It also involves 80% uh, uh, financing. Um, the median rent in the census estimates was 1,266 units. That rental does include subsidized rents that are clearly lower and will skew uh, the market rents. Through uh, our uh, research, the you know a lower cost market two bedroom apartment is more like seventeen hundred dollars, and that 
uh, will involve uh, uh, income of about $77,000, figuring in once again that 30% affordability uh, threshold. And um, we estimated some utility costs of uh, about $175 average per month. So, um, and that $77,000 is once again higher than that $65,000 Median household income and well higher than that 39,912 median renter household income. Also, we found that 38% of household had cost burdens. And by cost burdens, we mean those spending more than that uh, common definition of 30, you shouldn't be spending more than 30% of your income on housing costs. And 17% of all households had severe cost burdens, meaning that they were spending more than half their income on housing costs. If you look at those households earning at or below 80% of area median income, 62, more than 62% had cost burdens. And one third of all those households had severe cost burdens. Um, so there are, there are folks in the city who are struggling financially. Um, we also calculated an affordability gap of 145,000 for median income earning households. And that's the, def the difference between a median income earning household earning, what, 65,000 some odd change can afford based on 80% financing at that limit, we figured about $286,000. And the median price single family house of 431 thousand uh, dollars. So the, the housing plan includes a whole range of indicators of need based on income levels, based on uh, in the, the target population, um, including seniors, families, and those with disabilities. Uh, the plan suggests that the city continue to focus primarily on rental unit development. Uh, first of all, um, to target the needs of the community's most vulnerable residents. Um, and we know through the consolidated plan, through the analysis that we did, that um, the, the greatest need uh, in the community for those uh, earning at or below 50% of area median income, particularly those earning um, at or below 30% of area median income who are at risk of homelessness if they're not homeless already. Um, rental housing can get at some of those lower income tiers, but it's very challenging. Uh, continue to promote greater housing diversity, invest local resources to support greater numbers of households because rental units turn over more often than ownership uh, units over time. Uh, invest local resources to support great, well, provide more appropriately sized households for, for increasing numbers of smaller households. Um, you know, rental units tend to be uh, on, on average smaller than uh, ownership units. Offer opportunities for seniors to downsize in less uh, isolated settings. Uh, leverage other funds as almost all state and federal funding is directed to rental housing, uh, family rentals in particular. And enhance the ability to qualify occupants for housing subsidies as state requirements regarding financial assets make it very difficult for long-term owners to be eligible for assistance. So while there's a focus on rental housing, there is an acknowledgement that the city could also benefit from some additional starter housing um, and options for downsizing uh, as home ownership. Homeownership projects tend to be much smaller in scale. And I should mention that rental unit development, if done through 40B, all the units qualify as part of the subsidized housing inventory instead of the actual affordable units that are counted through home ownership units. So those communities that want to make real progress towards getting past that 10% uh, 
uh, goal, um, rental housing is uh, the ticket. The, the, the plan also suggests that the uh, community should focus on integrating more handicapped accessibility and supportive services into new development and redevelopment. Um, the P number of residents, 15.2 percent of all residents claim some type of disability, which is considerably higher than state and county levels at about, I think they're like 11 percent. So we know besides the aging of the population and um, that there is already a high um, population of those with special needs in the community. So it's important when new development goes through to be cognizant about uh, integrating um, some home modifications, unit modifications, and services. Also, older housing stock will require resources to support housing improvement and preservation work. Uh, Two-thirds of the units in PBD were built before 1980 um, and are more likely to have lead paint hazards uh, and um, deferred maintenance issues. Uh, So I'm going to go through and just provide kind of a short uh, uh, summary of uh, what, uh, what this, of the strategies that we've included in the plan. Uh, a lot of this is actually revisiting the previous plan, uh, tweaking it, providing more information uh, to um, kind of focus next steps. First is establish and capitalize a municipal affordable housing trust fund. Um, about a hundred communities in the state have uh, adopted these municipal affordable housing trust funds that um, are very easy uh, to uh, establish through a local bylaw that's approved by the Attorney General's office and um, then to capitalize the fund as a dedicated source of subsidies for housing initiatives. A lot of the communities are also using these municipal affordable housing trusts as their go-to municipal entity that oversees housing issues in the community. Um, and the community, we go through a number of uh, ways that these trusts can be uh, uh, capitalized. Uh, a lot of communities that have CPA uh, kind of automatically each year, at least the 10% of the minimum amount uh, set aside for community housing goes into the trust funds. Once money is dedicated, appropriated into the trust fund itself, that people, when the uh, trustees do not have to go back to the city council for, um, for approval of each item. Um, and then other communities have actually, um, through inclusionary zoning, cash out payments, they've used those uh, funds to, um, uh, to deposit into their trust funds. Um, donations and negotiations uh, with developers have also been used, um, et cetera. Conduct ongoing community outreach and education. Um, the plan suggests a number of avenues that the town should continue or um, be, uh, actually uh, uh, focus on more with respect to um, getting information out to the community on new housing initiatives to potentially uh, make sure that people understand what's being proposed, to have a rigorous inclusive and transparent process, and to hopefully also garner some real support when the initiatives come up for vote. Um, there are a number of strategies that are there to increase the number of affordable units. Um, first is to modify the inclusionary zoning ordinance. The city has um, specified that 15% of units and projects of either eight, uh, depending on the zoning, uh, uh, the zoning district, eight or more units or 15 or more units be set aside as affordable housing that are eligible for inclusion in the subsidized housing inventory. Um, the plan suggests that the city, which got rid of the um, cash out 
payment a number of years ago, uh, revisit that and put a, a cash out provision in. So there is some flexibility on the part of the developer instead of producing actual affordable units to, act, to provide some significant subsidy that would be deposited into the affordable housing trust fund for new affordable health, um, housing development elsewhere. One million dollars was raised previously through this uh, payment in lieu of actual unit provision, um, and that supported the Habitat project at Park Street, as well as help uh, save some of the affordability on the of, uh, units in the Tannery project. So we're both very important initiatives. Um, the, 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 the plan also suggests density bonuses, suggests um, uh, some clear rules about what um, uh, 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 to convey to developers on what is required, a couple of other things. The plan, and this is a kind of something that the, the city has been actively uh, exploring, is to pursue 40R, 40S smart growth zoning. So chapter 44, section 55, uh, see, I actually is uh, the, um, of the um, no, I, I, 40R, um, smart growth zoning, allows smart growth overlay districts where the city, through its zoning, provides um, opportunities to concentrate denser, more compact, mixed-use development in appropriate locations. So it, 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 it allows, uh, it's so it, zoning can, we know can be a powerful tool, and these zone, zoning overlay districts um, can be important in guiding development to those areas where it makes sense and alleviating some of the pressure in areas that uh, should not be uh, built. Uh, the town, the city has been exploring this type of uh, smart growth zoning and it has been able to uh, obtain a number of resources for doing it. Um, there's been a particular interest in looking at the North River Neighborhood District as a potential 40R location. Um, it uh, did receive mass developments transformative district initiative funding um, and use some of that funding to, for a master plan for the area that was done by Sasaki and Associations, so, Associates. Um, it received some MAPC technical assistance money, looking into some preliminary feasibility of locating a 40R smart growth overlay district in the North River uh, area, um, looking at numbers of units that might be developed and um, conducting some outreach to get some input from the community uh, about um, a 40R in that area. And also it's obtained a housing development incentive um, program approval from the state that offers some tax incentives and um, um, in order to spur market rate housing and some economic development activities. So there are some layers of resources uh, it's that the city has so far uh, been able to bring to bear in uh, kind of their kind of early uh, research on um, a 40R smart growth zoning district. So, um, 40R includes a number of basic requirements. One is that um, there, there needs to be a certain levels of density. It's kind of a carrot approach. There are incentives that the state provides through funding streams um, to promote the adoption of these districts and municipalities. Um, the zoning uh, is important to have design guidelines because once adopted, development happens by right. So design guidelines where, this, where the city really does establish what it wants to see built there is, are, are become very um, important. And it does integrate affordability. At least 20% of the units have to be affordable at or below 80% area median income, et cetera. But a lot of communities that have adopted 40R districts have gone to that 25% requirement for rental development, so all the units in a rental development can be counted towards the SHI. 
And I just mentioned 40S, which came, was passed a year later after 40R, um, basically says that any net increases in costs uh, in local schools that were borne by residents, students moving into the 40R district are covered by uh, the state. Uh, the plan also includes um, promoting 40B, friendly 40B development through the local uh, initiative program. These are, this is a situation where the town, the city actually works with a developer uh, in a, um, a project where the city believes it is uh, the project meets priority needs and pref preferences, um, and they basically both jointly apply to the state to submit a comprehensive permit application to the, um, the zoning board. So basically, it's a, it's a partnership with uh, developers where the, the community basically sets uh, the terms and conditions of the development. Um, and then make suitable public property available for affordable housing. There's a uh, precedent for this in PBD. Uh, last year, the city issued a request for proposals for the development of 70 Anticott Street. Um, and uh, there has been discussion about the potential Berry property that uh, will provide, um, David's going to provide some kind of visual representations of what that uh, what might be accommodated on that site. But there's some potential opportunities that that uh, might be developed to include affordable housing as well. Um, in any case, when the state, when the, when the city conveys uh, city-owned property, it goes through a request for proposals process and selects the most qualified developer um, to build the units based on the terms and conditions, again, that are included in the RFP. Um, modify the family accessory living uh, was it FALA? What is the, the accessory living areas uh, ordinance, which are uh, accessory dwelling units? The city uh, has restricted occupancy of the units to family members and also kind of low uh, square footage. The um, plan suggests consideration of some. Um, kind of opening up more flexibility uh, in the guideline in the uh, in the zoning for accessory dwelling units because accessory dwelling units meet a number of public purposes um, when we have so many seniors for example who are spending more than half their income on housing and are living in housing that is much larger than they need the opportunity to have a rental stream from an accessory dwelling unit, um, we basically recommend that uh, that should be considered um, as a way of promoting affordability in the existing, um, existing units uh, that won't have significant impact on uh, neighborhoods. Uh, promote non-traditional housing models. Uh, there are various types of housing that address a wide range of housing needs that aren't allowed in zoning. And the plan suggests that the, the planning board um, and uh, other local leaders uh, look at potential changes to the zoning bylaw or ordinance in order to promote such units to just give you a range of examples of uh, live workspace, uh, adaptive reuse, uh, such as the tannery, uh, pocket neighborhoods with you know small cottage development around a green space in existing uh, neighborhoods that have been effective in um, other communities. And there are other types of um, housing um, that are included in the plan and suggest that there uh, be some real uh, revisiting of zoning to see um, how they might be accommodated. And consider changes to the cluster development ordinance. At this point, there are only single family units are allowed and there are no, uh, there's no inclusion of affordable housing mandates and we suggest that that um, 
be uh, looked at, uh, changes will be reviewed to allow those mandates to happen. Um, the other category of strategies is to preserve existing affordability and prevent homelessness. Uh, one is monitor and maintain SHI units. So as soon as units can be counted, are eligible to be included in the subsidized housing inventory, the appropriate documentation needs to be submitted to the state and that SHI clearly monitored. Also, uh, to keep an eye on those units that do have some expiring use uh, restrictions. As I mentioned before, the city's been pretty effective of working with, uh, uh, with the state through, for example, the Chapter 40T process at the tannery um, to extend affordability, but uh, it's important to kind of uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, continue to fund the housing rehab ef um, efforts. The city has, a, has a work, uh, work, been working with the Mercer Habitat for Humanity on a critical home repair program, and we suggest that that funding uh, continue. Also to look at how you can convert existing housing to long-term affordability. Uh, for example, that was done through the Habitat for Humanities Park Street project where the city heavily invested in that um, uh, substantial rehab, gut rehab of existing uh, housing that uh, was were converted to affordability. There are other ways of converting existing housing to long-term affordability, which are um, summarized in the, um, in the housing plan. And provide funding to fight homelessness. Um, the, the city has been kind of the lead entity, not only in um, coordinating federal home program funding, but also um, as part of the North Shore Continuum of Care Alliance that um, looks at, um, works with a number of agencies on um, emergent, supporting emergency shelters and other important programs to help those who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, and the um, one program is a, um, a tenant-based rental assistance program through the North Shore Community Action uh, Program that provides some really important uh, support to very low-income households to help them uh, stabilize, uh, find stable and affordable housing. But the plan goes in other examples of, uh, of, the, of the city's support in preventing homelessness. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to David and uh, go through some um, housing opportunities. Hi, so, so thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. And um, is, my name is David Eisen. I'm an architect and a planner. And um, Karen and I often work together on these kinds of studies. Um, affordable housing is about programs and policies, but it's also about getting real buildings built in real neighborhoods, and that tends to be the tough part. The programs and policies are hard enough, but getting stuff built is, um, it's a difficult undertaking. So when we, you know, look at ways to get affordable housing built, places where it could go, we're always looking for opportunities to leverage that development to accomplish something other than create affordable housing. And that is important in and of itself. But uh, affordable housing can development can do a lot of things that are good for everybody in every, in every neighborhood, in every city, in every town. Affordable housing development can support downtown revitalization. If you have more people living downtown, that's more people who can eat at the restaurants, shop at the stores, work in the stores, work in the restaurants, be able to get where they need to go without using a car. And the affordable housing development can take underutilized or really rundown neighborhoods and properties 
and bring them back to life, making neighborhoods better and increasing property values for everybody. And affordable housing development can make public access to open space um, easier and better. So I'm gonna show you some examples where we are thinking that the, you know, the, the, the city should support affordable housing development where you can accomplish these things. So, up, uh, um, and I don't know whether this red dot, uh, it's sort of visible. You know, so we looked at, um, there are six locations up here. For one of them we're gonna kind of take off the table. Um, Main Street, you know, good opportunity to fill those sort of missing teeth in what is really a, 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 a quite nice downtown. Um, yeah, um, Berry Street. This is, you may not even know where that is, or I see a head going up and down, you may know where it is. It's buried in the middle of a block, surrounded by a nice neighborhood, a whole bunch of land being used for not much of anything. Um, Newberry Street, um, sort of right on Route 1, not necessarily the best place to live, but there's a fair amount of property there could, that could be redeveloped um, to, 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 to sort of build out the neighborhoods that are already there. Um, Pulaski Street, in some ways, what a great location. It's waterfront property, but you wouldn't know it by if you went by there now. Um, and North Shore Mall, man, there is a lot of parking with very few parking spaces in there. So opportunities for housing development. So I'm gonna go through these in a little more detail. Berry Street, and you know, Everybody's far, far away. We were talking about actually moving all the chairs up on stage. It's a little late to do that. Um, so this triangle is Berry Street and it, a series of houses around an open space. Right now it's nothing but a rundown building and asphalt. And 60 units, 60 parking spaces. So hopefully you can make these out a bit building, 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 driveway access. And we were figuring these as were townhouses over flats. Now what are townhouses over flats? They look something like this. You have an apartment downstairs and you have a townhouse up above and the advantage of doing that is it has a real neighborhood character and quality, but you can get a whole bunch of units on a fairly small piece of land. And in the case here, we have parking in a parking lot behind, but we're suggesting here is the parking can kind of slide, there's some parking lots and can slide underneath the buildings. Um, Main Street. So existing building, existing building, existing building. This is a proposed new building. Right now there's a building way back at the back and it's a great big parking lot. You can have retail along the street house, with, with parking behind it, housing up above, 24 units, 40 parking spaces. You know, you could add another floor to it. You know, you could have 36 units. So the, you know, how many parking spaces and how many units is up for grabs. But the idea is to continue the, um, you know, the street front, um, you know, reinforce the character of the, of the, of the, of the downtown, get more people down there. Um, this, we're gonna skip over this, Newbury Street. So right now, there's a couple of buildings here, you know, underutilized, and the trailer park. So trailer parks serve a valuable function. They provide affordable housing, but can we do a better job of doing what the trailer uh, park is doing? It, we think we can. So a new street running down here, connecting back to Pine Street, and connecting up, whoop, how did, pushing the wrong button here. Um, um, line by duplex, you could call them cottages, you can call them small homes. So, geez, I don't know why, sorry about that. Um, so, it, these are shown as duplexes. These, these could also be single family homes uh, along a winding street, planted with trees, trees. What a nice little neighborhood. And you'd still have retail out front because I don't think you want residential along Newberry Street. There's too much traffic along Route 1. Pulaski Street. 
So there are a couple of old mill buildings that have been converted along here. There isn't much of anything here. It's being used for, for different kinds of storage, I think school buses. What about if you built a new quote unquote mill building? I don't know why is this has a life of its own. Um, so ground floor retail could be a big, you know, brew pub with some boutique stores down there, three stories of housing up above. It's kind of hidden here, but a nice open deck, eat outside on a nice day, walk down here, rent canoes and kayaks, and go out in the river. So what's now is, a, is an overgrown lot, could really be a fantastic place connecting to the water. There's a lot of parking here. Um, you know, let me, hold on a second. Um, there's a whole strip down below. There we go. You know, um, I thought there was something missing from here. Oh, there's a lot of parking because there's retail on the ground floor and housing up above, but make this a much better site than it is now. And there we go. Um, and North Shore Mall. Right now, parking spaces, parking spaces, parking spaces. Um, you could get 600 units here taking, you know, not a, not a whole lot of the parking that's there. So green space, housing, um, over here, over here, over here. Um, they use the mall parking during the day. There's, um, you know, people leave for work and it's used for the mall parking and at night the mall empties out and people use it for their residential parking. <laughs> so these are some of the opportunities we see. And again, I apologize this is so, so far away, but hopefully the idea comes across that there are a lot of opportunities here that we really believe are good for the city and certainly good if you need affordable housing. So those are some of the thoughts. And I guess we want to turn it over to you for questions either about what Karen was talking about or about some of the things I've shown. And these are just examples of the kind of things that could be done. But we think they're doable with the right policies, plannings, and um, you, you know, zoning and incentives in place. So I see hands up, and Karen, you want to be the mistress of ceremonies here, or? Uh... I, I don't know. Go. Okay. Sorry, if you said it before. I, I don't have to hear Can you tell me what the price would be on an affordable house? What's the max you can sell it for? In theory. Well, I, I, I hate to do this, but there, it depends on whether it, this, you know, how many bedrooms, it tends to be the so condo, three bed. Well, I got I, the other thing is that um, the fiscal year 19 income limits uh, just came up. I can tell you that a two-bedroom condo in Needham is being sold for $254,000. Um, it has uh, condo fees of $236. So it would be pretty, and you know, you have to, you know, taxes vary, and you got to put all that information in to crank out. But probably, uh, you know, 254000 for a two-bedroom condo is probably what would be a kind of a going, going rate in PBD2. So a house possibly a stick-built house mm -hmm. on a piece of land owned by the city that would be worth $254,000. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? For two, it would be higher for three bedroom. Because, yeah. I'm thinking a house with three bedrooms, another house, a duplex, and a house with three bedrooms. This is in one, one of the units. 
Yeah. Yeah. You could you you could do that. Yep. For you know, once again, it depends on the condo fees and the taxes, and you have to enter it all in. The DHCD has to approve the purchase price. For a two-bedroom, yes. For a three-bedroom, higher. Well, it yeah, I see mixes of twos and threes. Yeah. Yes. Each bedroom. Each bedroom. Mm-hmm. Then the other question I have is regarding fathers who mentioned modifying our current ordinances. What do you mean by uh, so basically take out the family part of the assisted living as far as modifying the ordinances? Yes, I think it makes sense to try to encourage um, those kinds of units because they do serve a number of public benefits without changing the, the, the neighborhood character. But if you can, if, if you if you can open up and not restrict to the families, you're going to have more likelihood that there will be an income stream that will help keep an existing owner in place and allow them to stay in the community, particularly seniors. Well, I mean, it's it's not altogether clear that the family is going to be paying rent. I mean, that's it's 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 not a done deal. Whereas, you, if you have uh, somebody who's not family, there's going to be a rental payment. So, just allowing, and not everybody who has the ability in, within their their house to create an affordable uh, an accessory dwelling unit, um, and has. A family member that they can bring in. So I think the idea that we're trying to promote in the plan is how can you make the, bi the ordinance more flexible so that more such units can be created, I think is kind of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. well, we also suggest including them in detached structures, not just limiting it to the primary structure too. And also, we suggest am amnesty provisions. So those illegal apartments that you know are out there, there's ability to um, make sure that the, the uh, health and safety ha um, hazards might be mitigated by having them come and get permitting. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. You know what, it, it, there is this um, language in 40R, they talk about areas of concentrated development, uh, areas near transportation, and I think there's another category, and then other suitable locations. In fact, the majority of the 40R districts that improved are not transport oriented, transport, uh, uh, tra uh, transit oriented development. But there are areas in a community where some amount of density makes sense. Usually they are near some bus lines, transportation, goods, you know, already some mixed uses, some commercial uses. They have a number of characteristics where um, it made sense to include them. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got I can tell you that they're paying annually to the towns that have qualified for 40S. Um, I, I don't think there are a lot of them, maybe a handful. I, I, I'm trying to think back, remember which ones. Um, they're not a lot, but they're paying annually.
There would be serious pushback, though, from communities now that, you know, we have so many communities participating. And the state has made an effort to increase that um, trust fund. They've increased the, um, not only allocated additional money, they've increased the amount of f fees uh, for registry fees that would go be funneled into the, um, the funding for um, for 40, 40R and um, for CPA too. So there is, there is, I think, a conscious effort. But what, you don't know what the future is going to bring. But there is certainly a ton of interest in promoting 40R on the part of the state. Let me just mention a couple of other things. Those communities that um, pass 40R get um, um, kind of are more competitive for a whole range of state discretionary funds, including MassWorks infrastructure money. The other thing is they get extra points. If you're gonna build a new school, Natick got uh, an ex extra points because they had a 40R district. And so there was another, um, I think it was like $850,000 they got just because of the 40R. And then two other communities, I think Reading and East, and uh, they, had, they were fighting a couple of uh, 40B developments that went up to the Housing Appeals Committee. And the Housing Appeals Committee said, look, these communities in good faith are really trying to do the right thing with respect to promoting affordable housing and smart growth through their 40Rs. And they said they, they denied the, uh, the appeal by the developer. So there, there are kind of layers uh, of, uh, because the state is so uh, uh, focused and committed to promoting smart growth in 40R. And I, I didn't completely mention, besides there are financial incentives in 40R. So yes, based on projected number of new units and based on building permit activity, there is a funding stream. So um, it's certainly worth uh, moving forward on, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Twenty-five percent based on a special permit or based on forty B. Wow! Did you give a lot of? It was an overlay district, and the the affordability requirement was twenty-five percent. Hmm. Well, I mean, the question is how much more density you're giving the developer. Uh, I mean there. If you're giving them a lot more density, you're increasing the value of the property, and potentially, um, you know, more could be uh, be required. Um, you got to make sure that the project's economically feasible uh, when you're doing inclusionary zoning. And without seeing the projects, it's hard to say whether it's. I think 15% at this point, citywide, based on inclusion to zoning, makes some sense. Um, your income, you know, the housing prices are going up, but they're still um, well behind some of the other, you know, cities that are doing 20, 25 percent. So I think you're in a good place right now and just should watch it. 25 percent, my sense is that you need to be giving some serious density to acquire that to make the project economical.
No, yeah, you know, I, I think in, in, in the strategy, we suggest that if you're going to reinstate the cash out fee, you got to provide something to the developer in the case density bonuses make, make sense. Otherwise, it could be taken as a taking of the property rights of, of the developer. I think actual units are better than having the cash out fee, but there are some instances where it does make sense to have money. The, the issue is you got to make sure that the formula included in the fee is substantial enough to, to cover that affordable unit, and that becomes very important. You know, hopefully in the plan we've provided enough examples of how you can actually invest local resources instead of having funding sitting, you know, aside for how many years. Um, there should be some competition and interest in, those, in that funding as a gap filler or in support for programs, et cetera. So, I hear what you're saying, but um, I, I guess my, my sense of being in this field for a long time is where you can provide some flexibility that really does end up um, making a commitment in promoting uh, affordable housing that, you know, using, having that flexibility is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Construction costs? I gotta say, we did not get into construction costs in this. Well, the market's the market. The market's the market. So on the market units, um, the cost is a factor, um, but the market is going to dictate what the price will be based on its location, et cetera. For affordable housing, uh, it's prescribed based on state formula. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, the price of the unit is, is actually dictated by uh, state formulas. It, 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 you no, know, it does, because the prices are typically indexed to changes in HUD area median income levels, and because different regions have different income limits, uh, there will be a change from, like, Springfield uh, metropolitan area, their income limits are lower than the Boston area median income limits. Every year, those income limits are increased. This year was, hmm? So the average income is a predictable increase because of the casino going in, just like uh, 495 Foxbowl, Milford, Duxbury, uh, Dundee, that area was always lesser. Yeah. Than the whole yeah. Worcester County, yep. Yeah. You know, I've noticed significant increases across the areas, though, this year. You know, deep in the, in the recesses of HUD in D.C., there are folks doing algorithms. They have formulas for somehow coming up with these annual income limits. And God knows, you know, uh, how, you know some, some years there's hardly any change, and then you have a year like to this year where they really went up so much. Um, but uh, kind of outside our control. You know, you're, TBD is about the only place I know of where you actually have some of those mobile homes included as part of the SHI. Either the housing rehab program or I think the, you had invested 
uh, some subsidies and somehow got it on the SHI. Um, there have been a lot, you know, there was that appeal process back how many years ago, a few years ago, where there was this whole uh, question about appealing 40B, and a big part of that were communities like Carver and others where they had a ton of these mobile homes and they wanted to have them covered, uh, included. But it never got enough traction. I think, A, the, J, the state just doesn't count them as permanent, and B, mobile homes are not considered in financing real estate. They're like your RV or they're like a, a personal property. So financing them becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, I don't see anything in the near future happening with that, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yes, in, in order to say, say they say they allowed mobile homes, you or you still have to meet all the requirements that I went in that slide. So, for example, if a unit is already occupied, whether it's in a mobile home or in an existing building, you know, despite income and all of that, you can't count it unless you can affirmatively market the unit, which means it cannot be occupied already. So, you know, it's not like a slam dunk to get these units counted anyway. But the mobile homes have another issue related to this idea of permanency. Even though most of them are on foundations now, and there's still that kind of issue of permanency. Yeah. Um, recently, they, uh, April and a few other places have done some veterans affordable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that count uh, as affordable housing? As long as the units met, meet all those requirements that I went through as part of being eligible for inclusion in the subsidized housing inventory, you have to follow those, um, those basic rules. There are a lot of communities who have done it. Um, um, New Bedford did a project not that long ago for veterans. No, there are examples of those across the state. Anything? Anybody else? Well, the next steps on this will be that we need planning board approval and city council approval before the plan can be submitted to the state for the state's approval. Uh, so there'll be uh, uh, hearings coming up uh, with respect uh, to uh, those. And if you think, excuse me, if you can think of other questions or comments that you might have, uh, you know, direct them to, where's Stacy? <laughs> Stacy Burns, you wanna just provide your, um, uh, some contact information, even people hearing this, uh, out on public access television where they might be able to submit comments? Great. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate your being here this evening.